Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the March 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of Crisis of Capitalist Culture by Nikolai Bukharin from 1934. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe, and consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So this file is hosted at the Marxist Internet Archive, marxists.org, fantastic resource, hosts thousands of free Marxist texts. Their source is New Masses for December 1934, and this file was scanned, prepared, and annotated for the Marxist Internet Archive by Paul Fleurs. So this is the first audiobook that I've done from Bukharin. I'll be covering Bukharin at greater length when we get into the whole post-Lenin-Trotsky-Stalin split in the early years of the USSR. But basically, Bukharin was an old guard Bolshevik whose membership in the party dated back to 1906. He was popular and influential, holding a variety of high posts, including the editor of Pravda and his Vestia. Although, after Lenin's death, he would fall in and out of favor or sometimes be at odds with and sometimes wouldn't be at odds with the Soviet government. And while that's arguably true of any individual in any given situation, that sometimes you're in line with it, sometimes you're on this side, sometimes you're on that side of it, I feel like Bukharin's legacy is somewhat defined by first he was sort of on this side of things and then over here in fairly pronounced ways, and we'll go through that more as we go through uh, Bukharin's legacy of writings and contributions to the socialist communist movement. Anyway, this particular piece from 1934 comes out of a period from about 1934 to 36 when Bukharin did a lot of writing about fascism and sort of the emerging danger coming out of Europe, you know, watching what was going on in Italy, Germany in particular and trying to sound the alarm about and analyze that. He would be arrested as part of the Great Purge in 1937 and executed in 1938, but this was when he was still in good standing, I guess we could say. So all of that said, let's get into the text. Section 1. The Paradox of Fascism. It is now generally admitted that we are living in a period of very great historical cataclysms, of violent upheavals in all social life, of the most radical changes, and of the crash of old systems of material existence and the old outlook on life. Wars, revolutions, the crisis, the dictatorship of the proletariat, fascism, the threat of new wars, the heroic struggle of the Austrian workers, all these facts are extremely ominous for capitalism, which might say, with Horatio, in what particular thought to work I know not, but in the gross and scope of my opinion, this bodes some strange eruption to our state. The strain of the contradictions which are under constant pressure in the unbearably stuffy atmosphere of the capitalist world may at any moment end in some new catastrophe, quite unexpected in its form. However, we can trace a basic historical tendency of development through the cinematographic swiftness and motley change of events. This tendency is expressed first and foremost in the unusually intensive process of the polarization of the classes, the great differentiation in all social forces and ideologies, the sharpening of the struggle between fascism and communism as two class camps, two doctrines, two cultures. If we were to characterize the entire historical situation briefly from this point of view, we might say that the great class forces are forming in military array for coming battles, for the battles which will really be final in the world historic sense and really decisive. For this reason, fascism must be subjected to thoughtful study in all its aspects, from its economics down to its philosophy. And all these already exist, for the bourgeois ranks are being reorganized with enormous swiftness, both in the form of so-called national revolutions and in the form of plain fascism. These forms vary greatly, but one cannot doubt their common historical tendency and the common root of their social and political class significance. A long time ago, before the series of bourgeois revolutions, feudalism gave birth to the absolute monarchy. The czars, emperors, and kings, in alliance with the petty, landowning nobility, 
and with the support of the towns, crushed some of the big feudal lords. And by doing this, strange as it may seem, put off the historical date of the end of feudalism. They strengthened feudalism and centralized its basic forces under the absolute monarchy, which was overthrown by the bourgeois revolution. Another world historic paradox is now being enacted on the historical stage, under entirely different conditions, and in an entirely different manner. In the national revolutions, quote-unquote, finance capital and the Junkers, supported by the petty bourgeoisie, a section of the intelligentsia, and even certain groups of duped workers, advance anti-capitalist slogans, preach national socialism, and even sacrifice a section of their class colleagues, Jewish capital and, quote, non-Aryans in general, while at the same time they strengthen capitalism, or rather, attempt to strengthen it, by gathering all their forces for the defense of capital and by declaring a preventive war on the working class, on communism, and on Marxism. Fascist, quote, order is the order of military, political, and economic barracks. It is the military capitalist system of a state of emergency. This expresses itself in a number of most important facts. In the tendency towards state capitalism, in the common national, corporate, etc. dictatorship, with the suppression of a number of internal contradictions, in the establishment of various mono-systems, mono-nation, mono-party, mono-state, or totalitarian state, etc. In the organization of mass human reserves, petty bourgeois and in part working class, in a whole incorporated ideology, attuned to the basic interests of finance capital, and, finally, in the creation of a material and ideological war base. The so-called fascist national revolutions, with their anti-capitalist slogans, are really, in essence, but a speedy reorganization of the bourgeois ranks, eliminating parliamentary changes and the system of competing parties, introducing uniform military discipline all along the line, and organizing mass reserves. The petty bourgeois philistines of the, quote, center, will say, but you communists also do many of these things. Or, as the social democratic petty bourgeois phrase it, there is dictatorship here and dictatorship there, both equally abominable. Or, there is, quote, left Bolshevism and there is, quote, right Bolshevism, and there is no difference in principle between them. These miserable people, who receive blows both from the left and from the right, do not understand that the formal side of the matter alone, dictatorship in general, which they understood incorrectly at that, does not decide anything. The important thing is its class meaning, its content, material and ideological, the dynamics of its development, its relationship with the general current of world historical development. Only imbeciles can fail to understand that the dictatorship of the proletariat and the dictatorship of the capitalists are polar opposites and that their content and historical significance are entirely different. Those who cannot or will not understand this will inevitably be crushed and plunged into the inglorious refuse of history. That's the end of section one. Moving on to section two, the crisis and fascist ideology. Thus fascism, in its essence, is a product of the general crisis of capitalism, as Joseph Stalin has emphasized. But from this it follows that the coming of fascism, in creating something new, reactionarily new, in the capitalist ways of living and thinking that had been formed before its coming, could not but bring with it a profound crisis in certain important bourgeois orientations. It should be stated that not all aspects of this complex reorientation are of the same depth or of the same stability. Doubtless, many aspects are changing and will change, depending to a great extent on the curve of the economic cycle. But many aspects, of course, will remain until the development and conclusion of the class struggle puts forward problems of an entirely different nature. If we are to speak of the fascist bourgeoisie's political and economic platforms and guiding ideas, we must note facts of this sort. Point 1. The crisis in the orientation towards swift technical progress. 
There was especially profound pessimism in this field during the years of the greatest decline in the cyclical curve. It is well known that all the leading technical publications, Machine Building, American Machinist, and hundreds of others, were full of discussion on the question, is technology beneficial or harmful? Engineer Heilmick wrote in Machine Building that, quote, there is an enormous army of writers who take a negative attitude towards technology and even wish for or predict its death. The economic journals strongly recommend a decrease in the rate of technical development. The bourgeois philosophers began to chant melancholy tunes in a discordant chorus about the soullessness of machine civilization in general. The Kaiserlings, our Berdievs, and company, who are suspiciously close to the fascist staffs, and the inevitable dean of philosophy, Oswald Spengler, who preaches the doom of Europe and of Bismarck's, quote, socialism, have all begun to criticize technology as such, not the capitalist application of technology, for that would be a criticism of the very foundations of capitalism and capitalist exploitation, but technology itself. Quick comment there. In this translation, it says technique in those three spots instead of technology, but I believe technology makes more sense. Or rather, technique doesn't really make any sense. Anyway, there's a couple of footnotes there. Hermann Alexander Graf Kaiserling, lived 1880 to 1946, was a German philosopher and founder of the Gesellschaft für Freie Philosophie, or the Society for Free Philosophy. He called for a world order based on democratic principles. Second, Nikolai Alexandrovich Berdyaev, 1874 to 1948, was a Russian legal Marxist who subsequently became a mystical Christian socialist. He was expelled from the Soviet Union in 1922. And Oswald Arnold Gottfried Spengler, 1880 to 1936, was a German philosopher most famous for his deeply pessimistic work, Decline of the West, completed in 1914, published in 1918, with a sequel volume published in 1923, which considered that the Western world was doomed. He stood on the authoritarian right wing of German politics, but his relations with the Nazis were uneasy because of his rejection of their racial theories. Back to the main text. The machine, Spengler affirms, is beginning to hinder the human being, the multitude of automobiles in the streets. Quote, in Argentina, Java, and other places, the small landowner's simple plow is superior to big motors and is beginning to drive them out. Unquote. It's quoting from Man and Technics, a contribution to a philosophy of life. The end of modern machine culture is inevitable. Quote, this machine technology, Spengler writes, will end with the Faustian human being and will some fine day be destroyed and forgotten. Railroads and ships, like the Roman roads and the Chinese wall, our giant cities and their skyscrapers, like old Memphis and Babylon." Unquote. Such funereal reactionary tunes have become the ideological fashion. The great optimism that was formerly felt concerning technological progress has undoubtedly disappeared. Faith in it has been undermined by the whole trend of the general crisis of capitalism. Point two. The crisis in the orientation towards further industrialization is very closely connected with the above. If technological progress is stopped, the productive forces will inevitably decline or come to a standstill. This is assisted by the search for guarantees of safety against the, quote, plague of the proletariat, the back-to-the-land propaganda, the doctrine of the patriarchal bond with Mother Earth, and the return to the land. Whence re-agrarianization? Hitler's slogan is, the land above all, it gives stability, it is the source of conservatism. The experiences of the fascist movement in Italy, in Germany, and in Austria, the rich peasants of the Tyrol, the Italian agrarian bourgeoisie, the Catholic Church, especially in the agrarian districts, etc., oblige the fascists to turn decisively towards the land, which of course is far from hindering the rule of finance capital. The problem of internal colonization, of moving the population from the cities to the countryside in the struggle against unemployment, the Siedlungsproblem, is one of the essential questions of the German internal policy. Friedrich Hielscher has expressed the coming ideological superstructure with classic clarity in his book, The Empire. Quote, becoming more rural will mean becoming poorer 
and more primitive, and perhaps wilder and more barbarous. But on the other hand, it will mean becoming more Germanic. Barbarism carries its own justification. Unquote. Sapienti sat. Comment would surely be superfluous. A couple of footnotes there. Friedrich Hielscher, lived from 1902 to 1990, was an adherent of the German conservative revolutionary movement, a neo-pagan, and an advocate of a mystical form of German nationalism. He opposed the Nazis' racial theories and their regime, and was briefly held after the bomb plot against Hitler in July 1944. As for sapienti sat, it means enough for the wise, it is self-evident, no more need be said. Continuing with the main text. Point three, the crisis in the orientation towards the world market. The tendency which had previously flourished in this field, with the old optimistic laissez-faire theory, is being replaced by the doctrine of a decided autarky, that is, a confined, quote, self-sufficient economy, almost independent of world economy. Certain governments which are becoming fascist, or are already fascist, especially Germany, showed this process very clearly. It is not difficult to see the basic economic roots of this tendency and this policy. I'm referring to the militant economic and military preparations, to, quote, independence from imports, which are not guaranteed during war, and the consequent corresponding decline in the proportion of exports. The obliging economists have already deduced a whole, quote, law of decreasing world connections. The Japanese social fascists justify annexation by the necessity of having, quote, enough of everything for the building of socialism under the rule of the Mikado. The German fascists formulate the problem as the problem of the, quote, greatest possible economic independence. Ferdinand Fried puts this question very clearly, indeed, in his book Autarchy, in which he gives the lofty ideology of this autarchy, the autarchy of self-sufficiency and the autarchy of self-government, that is, political independence. Quote, the nation, he declares, which is now being born in the German Revolution, note, this refers to the fascist, quote, revolution, has gone through an intensive internal survey and wants to be self-sufficient and rule itself through itself. The French Revolution will produce social nationalism. The field of social nationalism is not the world, but the nation, the people, the human being, unquote. Footnote, this is quoting from Fried's Autarchy, 1932. Ferdinand Friedrich Fried, real name Zimmermann, lived 1898 to 1967, was a German economist and philosopher and an advocate of an autarchic economy. He joined the SS in 1934 and the Nazi party in 1936 and worked as a journalist in post-war West Germany. Back to the main text. This is, of course utter nonsense as far as the, quote, field is concerned. There is no talk of the fascist states refusing to go out into the world or field. The race for armaments and the foreign policies of these states do not permit us to accuse them of provincialism, but it is precisely for the purpose of struggle on the world field that they are breaking down the ideology of a world of free trading connections. The continuous growth of nationalism and the military character of its entire ideology form the appropriate superstructure for the imperialist fascist autarky. Point four. The crisis of the liberal bourgeois parliamentary state is one of the outstanding manifestations of the military and political preparation of the bourgeoisie. So is its transition to dictatorship through the destruction of bourgeois democracy and the organization of an open dictatorship with one party and a complete terrorist government apparatus, from the armed forces down to the university chairs and the art academics. Here, we must point out that the so-called corporate state is trying to draw the basic links of economy into its own hands on the basis of state capitalism, and is speeding up the process of the centralization of capital in every possible way. It is obvious that the building of, quote, planned capitalism, which they preach under the name of National Socialism, is a fascist utopia, but there's no doubt whatsoever of the fact that, in leaning for support mainly on heavy industry, the fascists are tightening and militarizing certain important links in their economy, thus greatly increasing the pressure of state power. One of the leading Italian fascists, M. Beni, formulates the matter thus, quote, 
the rule of economic nationalism emphasizes this necessity, for all nationalism undertakes a political function first and foremost, and adapts or subordinates to it all other social functions. Unquote. There's a footnote there. Antonio Stefano Beni, lived 1880 to 1945, was a leading Italian industrialist, the president of the Confederazione Generale dell'Industria Italiana, and a supporter of Mussolini. He was Minister of Communications during 1935-39, to 39, and that quote was from Ignazio Silone, Der Fascismus, Seine Entstehung und Seine Entwicklung, 1934. Back to the main text. The representation of corporations, Italy, and of estates, Germany, is fictitious, for the quote, lower classes are quote, represented by members of the fascist staff, by quote, state-imposed chiefs, so to speak, of one or another front. The essence of it lies in the direct rule of capital itself, of the Tissons, the Krupps, the Trusts, the Banks, etc., on the basis of a centralized and operative, quote, complete power. Footnote there, Tissen and Krupp were leading German heavy industry cartels, both of which backed an aggressive imperialist foreign policy. Back to the main text. According to Mussolini, this system overcomes both capitalism and socialism. According to Fried, it is the embodiment of the, quote, Prussian idea of order and of Prussian, quote, socialism. Spengler says the same. Higher ideological structures develop on this basis into a whole philosophy of the totalitarian state, of the cooperation of all, of the leadership of the elect, in whom lies the spirit of God, of the realization of metaphysical values, etc. In any case, the old liberal orientation has been broken completely. We have at present a transition to the operative, complete dictatorship of finance capital, a terrorist dictatorship which has absorbed a number of mass fascist organizations. That's the end of section two. Moving on to section three, the crisis in bourgeois ideas. This sharp turn in the sphere of material culture, and the ideological spheres closest to it, finds its appropriate expression and reflection on the higher rungs of the ideological ladder. Here also, a swift reorientation is taking place, and the customary categories are turning out to be unsuitable for the new period. We have a profound crisis in all bourgeois spiritual culture, which says a great deal, we shall dwell here on certain especially clear manifestations of this crisis. 1. The crisis in ideas of evolution has developed on the basis of disillusionment about the progressive movement of capitalism. This disillusionment is growing and taking logical shape on a universal scale. The first stage is summed up very well by Walter Eucken. Quote, Marx thought, he tells us, quote, that the vital law of capitalism lies in ever-developing dynamics, and that the end of capitalist development would mean the end of capitalism itself. Modern political economy has shown that Marx's theoretical arguments on the necessity of these dynamics are false. Unquote. Footnote, Walter Eucken, 1891 to 1950, was a German economist who pioneered the concept of ordo-liberalism, in which the state would ensure the basis of a capitalist economy, he was involved in anti-Nazi activities during the Second World War. And that quote of his was from Staatliche Strukturwandlungen und die Krise des Kapitalismus, 1932. Back to the main text. The second stage, the universal spread of the negative attitude towards the idea of development, is found in the universalist Ottmar Spahn. In his Science of Categories, this professor proclaims certain remarkable truths. Quote, Darwin and Marx, he writes, quote, did a terrible injury to our culture by their mechanical understanding of evolution. For their understanding of evolution robs all activity of its value, as each day is conquered by the next day. And this gave rise to the utilitarianism, materialism, and nihilism, which characterize our times. Unquote. Footnote, Ottmar Spahn lived 1878 to 1950, he was an Austrian conservative philosopher and sociologist and the advocate of a corporate state. He joined Alfred Rosenberg's Militant League for German Culture in 1928 and the Nazi Party around 1930. That quote was from his Kategorienlehre, 1924. 
Back to the main text. In other words, only the conventional, quote, dynamics of simply grinding water in a mortar is of any value. As to real successful struggle and actually changing the world, that arouses human pride and turns people away from God and is therefore criminal. What formerly made up the fervor of the progressive bourgeoisie, what Bacon formulated with restrained passion as the flowering of humanity, is now crushed under the fascist heel of the gloomy servants of God. The bourgeoisie, whose path to further development has been blocked, cries down with development, down with the very idea of development. 2. The Crisis in the Ideology of Christian and Liberal Humanism The period of liberalism corresponded to the rosy dream of normal human relations, raised to the ethical standard of Kant's categorical imperative. This ideology, generally speaking, was very suitable for fairer competition, both in the field of internal relationships and in the field of international trade. Honesty, equality, respect, etc., with their wordy halo of hypocritical humaneness, were the official ethical doctrines connected with the real conduct of the people, and the word people formally included the lower classes. The semi-feudal romanticists and philosophers of reaction, in speaking of modern times we must mention Nietzsche, first of all, began to undermine this ideology. Quote, Whom do I detest most among the modern scoundrels, the socialist scoundrels, the apostles of the mob, who intrigue against the worker's instinct, contentment, and feeling of satisfaction with their modest life, who make the workers envious and teach them revenge? Footnote there, that's from Nietzsche's The Will to Power, an attempted transvaluation of all values, 1910. And might I just comment on that? Wow. I, I could leave it there, but I mean, really, wow. So basically you're saying that if no socialist agitators came along, people would be just perfectly content with their lot, however piss poor it is. No. For one thing, there are spontaneous uprisings constantly of oppressed classes throughout history, both in the current age and previously. And, of course, socialists in the current age try to give guidance and advice and leadership to spontaneous movements and, you know, try to get them into something constructive rather than just a spontaneous movement that isn't well guided, may not result in the attainment of its goals or of power, and may just sort of burn out flash in the pan style. Socialists often aren't able to connect necessarily with spontaneous movements. I mean, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't um, and, you know, provide some of that leadership. But anyway, point one, plenty of it happens on its own. Point two, even where socialists do go out to agitate, uh, agitation is a process of drawing out existing demands, not like implanting them as conservatives and defenders of the status quo would like to believe that, all was well and good, all was harmonious before these troublemaking socialist agitators came along and just created problems where there were none. Agitation, in other words, is a process of spotlighting and highlighting latent complaints. You know, if there was just total harmony, then socialism never would have gained ground anywhere. But because we have made a study of class oppression, class dynamics, the way that capitalism works and other systems prior to capitalism, we know what the stress points are and we know scientifically how to move society forward. And yeah, part of that process is talking with oppressed people about the desire to have a better life and the desire to solve problems that they're facing, particularly those stemming from class oppression, and pointing away towards a future where the workers take more power if they are daring enough to do so. So yeah, fuck Nietzsche. Uh, continuing, socialism, quote, is for the most part a symptom of the fact that we are treating the lower classes too humanely so that they get a taste of the happiness forbidden to them. It is not hunger that causes revolution. It is the fact that when the people begin to eat, they acquire larger appetites. Unquote. That is again quoting from The Will to Power, and by God, is that twisted fucking logic. That is diseased logic. So basically, the human imagination is the problem. Like, the fact that when people get a sense that life could be better, we start imagining 
you know, and extrapolating from that, that that's the fucking problem. Therefore, the only solution is to keep people in just utter misery constantly so that maybe they will never really, you know, latch on to the possibility of things improving. That's fucking amazing. Uh, that's arguably worse than most of the stuff you hear today, but I'm sure that there are still, you know, echoes of it today, just in slightly less, um, I mean, there are new forms of it, which are equally offensive in their own right, but, uh, that, that was a particularly bad, uh, line of attack from, uh, Nietzsche there in, uh, pursuit of his obviously, uh, awful anti-human, anti-worker viewpoint. Moving on. The modern bourgeois ideologists, who on the wings of their thoughts are flying straight back to the Middle Ages, are raising aloft all their animal hatred for other nations, in essence for the lower classes. The actual facts of this are universally known. Madame Omer de Gell, the queen of adventuresses, whose memoirs came out recently, might well envy the pathological sadistic passions of the fascists. But the interesting thing is that all this finds open, acknowledged, valued, almost philosophical expression. Spengler's analogy of the beast of prey is well known. It is worth our while to cite once more the tirade, expressive of his, quote, cultural perception, in which this philosopher praises the gorilla-like, quote, primitive man. Herr Spengler's touched, quote, the soul of this strong solitary is thoroughly militant, mistrustful, and jealous of his own power and gains. He throbs with emotion, when his knife cuts into the flesh of an enemy, groans and the odor of blood raise his feeling of triumph. Every real man, even in modern cultural cities, sometimes feels within him the smoldering fire of this primitive soul." Unquote. The fascist dramatist, Herr Joost, calls for priests, quote, who will spill blood, more blood, and still more blood, and declares, quote, when I hear of culture, I get my browning ready. Footnote there, Hans Joost, lived 1890 to 1978, was a German playwright and novelist. He joined Alfred Rosenberg's Militant League for German Culture in 1928. Subsequently, he and other pro-Nazi writers signed the Gelubnis Triester Gefolgschaft, a declaration of loyalty to Hitler. He became the head of the Union of German Writers in the Academy of German Poets, and he held positions in the SS during the Second World War. The line, when I hear the word culture, I release the safety on my browning, is spoken by a character in his play, Schlageter, a peon to the German ultranationalist executed by the French occupation forces in 1923. Back to the main text. Herr Herbert Blanc believes that in Bismarck's Thoughts and Reminiscences, there is more philosophy than in hundreds of works of university faculties, and that the development of character should be completed in the barracks. Frederick the Great, the officers' corps, and the barracks formed the ideal trinity of his, quote, philosophy. Footnote there, see Wir suchen Deutschland, 1931. Herbert Blanc, lived 1889 to 1951, was a German writer and editor. He was the secretary of the far-right Deutsche Volkische Freiheitspartei during the 1920s. He wrote many works under various pen names, including Weigand von Miltenberg, Karstans, a. Tiefenbach and Jörg Leubas. He was a leader of the Kampfgemeinschaft Revolutionärer Nationalsozialisten, or Black Front, set up by Otto Strasser in 1930, and he was jailed after this organization was banned by the Nazis in February 1933. Back to the main text. A nationalist fury is raging. Humane passages are crossed out, even in the New Testament, as, quote, Eastern influences. The Christian names are crossed out of the calendar and replaced by Teutonic ones. Back to the Votan is the password. The race theory, with its analysis of blood and sperm, is being elevated to the level of a scientific doctrine and is the basis of all policies. Alfred Rosenberg even explains the entire October Revolution by saying that, quote, Mongolian forces got the upper hand of the, quote, tall, shapely, light-haired people of German origin. Footnote there, this is quoting from Rosenberg's Der Zukunftsweg einer deutschen Außenpolitik, 1927. Alfred Ernst Rosenberg, 1893-1946, was a virulent anti-communist and anti-Semite, 
prior to his arrival in Germany from the Baltic region in 1918. He was an early member of the Nazi party and was considered by many as the party's philosopher. He was put in ministerial charge of the occupied eastern territories during the Second World War, and he attended the Wannsee Conference at which the extermination of Europe's Jews was outlined. He was executed after being tried for war crimes at Nuremberg. Back to the main text. The liberal Christian orientation has been replaced by frantic anti-Semitism and incredible contempt for the colonial peoples. See Hitler's Mein Kampf. This, however, while it causes the priests to revolt, does not prevent the Vatican from blessing the above-mentioned things and processes. 3. The crisis in the idea of formal equality. From the very backwaters of reaction, from Joseph de Maistre and company, they have fished out the idea of hierarchy, eternal hierarchy, not as a temporary historical phenomenon, but as a general and universal law of nature. See M. Berdeyev's book, The Philosophy of Inequality, written quite a long time ago. Comment, I would add, uh, Jordan Peterson, this was one of, you know, the whole lobster thing, lobster hierarchy, serotonin, all that stuff. This is uh, basically the same idea, eternal hierarchy as just, you know, innate, intrinsic to life, and you must obey it. Any idea of getting around hierarchy is just, you know, silly. There's a sort of like biological determinism to, you know, inequality. Not that it's a product of class society, anything like that, etc. Continuing, Hitler speaks openly and plainly of the rule of the aristocratic idea in nature and in society. And Meraki, in his famous speech, The Tasks of Japan in the Siowa Period, brings forward amusing, quote, philosophical arguments, which are supposed to prove the age-old superiority of the Japanese race. He compares human beings with various breeds of dogs, destined for different purposes. There's a few footnotes there. Joseph de Maistre lived 1753 to 1821, was born in Savoy of French origins. One of the founders of European conservatism, he promoted the concepts of hierarchy and monarchy, and he called for the re-establishment of the monarchy in France and supported the authority of the Roman Pope in temporal affairs. Then, Berdeyev's The Philosophy of Inequality was written in 1919. It does not appear to have been published in an English language edition. Finally, Sadao Araki lived 1877 to 1966, was a career officer in the Japanese military, minister for war, and for education in interwar Japanese cabinets, and a prominent member of various right-wing nationalist organizations. He was jailed for war crimes after the defeat of Japan in 1945. Back to the main text. Herr Spahn, the philosopher of Austro-German fascism, he's also their sociologist, their economist, etc., builds up a whole theory of society and government on the basis of a hierarchical demarcation between well-born and low-born members of society, returning to and theologizing old biological theories. The idea of hierarchy, gerarchia, is given exactly the same determining role by the Italian fascists. See Gentile. Footnote there, Giovanni Gentile, lived 1875 to 1944, was an Italian philosopher. He supported an aggressive foreign policy and Italy's entry into the First World War, and became a leading member of Mussolini's fascist regime, writing several key texts, including A Doctrine of Fascism, issued under Mussolini's name, and the Manifesto of the Fascist Intellectuals. He was captured and executed by the partisans. Back to the main text. Rocco, one of the leading ideologists of Italian fascism, has created a whole theory of government and rights, reflected rights. It is a well-knit theory of the serfdom of the low-born castes who are in bondage to a corporate state headed by the elite, the select, the illustrious, the trust owners, the bankers, the excellencies, and their spiritual and worldly servants. Footnote, Alfredo Rocco, 1875 to 1935, was an Italian jurist. He was a member of the Italian Nationalist Association, which merged with Mussolini's fascist party in 1923, and he served as Minister for Justice during 1925 to 32. Back to the main text. The idea of formal equality has broken down all along the line. The banners of the bourgeoisie now bear the legend hierarchy. Read The Rule of Capital. 4. 
The Crisis in Rational Thinking Disillusionment in the expediency of technical progress inevitably brought about disillusionment concerning the power of rational thinking. This is a subject worthy of detailed treatment. In order that the reader may immediately feel the aroma of the new positions on this question, we shall quote here the above-mentioned Herbert Blanc. In his controversial work, he asks directly, of what use, quote, to the German people is the science of Darwin, Virchow, dubois Raymond, Haeckel, Planck, and Einstein, which has broken the tie between the soul and God? And he answers, quote, we are more for the creed which is reviled as barbarism, for... I must remark, we consider the slogan, Back to Barbarism, which has come up during the last few years, as one of the best of the battle cries." Unquote. Science and rational thinking are replaced by theological and teleological metaphysics, mystical ravings, wild intuitions, occultism, telepathy, astrology, etc. The content of the new literature is simply incredible. Vitalism, and Jean's mathematical god are harmless toys when compared with the scholastic and mystical nonsense that is printed in the capitalist countries nowadays. Truly, it seems as though heavy giant lizards, dinosaurs, and iguanodons had again begun to crawl along the surface of the primitive earth. There's a footnote there. James Hopwood Jeans, 1877 to 1946, was a prominent British physicist, astronomer, and mathematician. Bukharin is probably referring to the statement in his The Mysterious Universe, quote, We have already considered with disfavor the possibility of the universe having been planned by a biologist or an engineer. From the intrinsic evidence of his creation, the great architect of the universe now begins to appear as a pure mathematician, unquote. Back to the main text. Such is, in rough outline, the picture of the cultural crisis in capitalist countries. This picture is far from complete, it is very poor compared with reality, but its basis is clear. It has been very well expressed by Spengler. Quote, it is our duty to hold on to the end to a lost position, without hope, without salvation. To hold on to the end like the Roman soldier whose bones were discovered before the gates of Pompeii, who perished because during the eruption of the Vesuvius he was not relieved from his watch. That is glory. That is the valor of a race. That honorable end is the only thing a man cannot be deprived of, unquote. Comment. Can you not, in 2022, hear some gamer chud just like salivating over those lines? Such is the intimate side of fascist ideology in all its glory. Moreover, the knight in a wild beast's skin is doing anything but standing watch. He is making considerable use of his club, but he will not prove the victor, as proved, among other things, by our growing socialist culture. And that's the end of the audiobook. So to add a comment to that last section, the one that I can definitely picture uh, Gamer Chud's going for, um, to hold on to the end to a lost position without hope, without salvation. This is basically the plan of the diehard capitalists. They, they really do not want to give up. So, you know, brace yourselves for that. Uh, this will be a, a difficult fight. You know, and I referenced Jordan Peterson before him and, you know, the rest of the intellectual dark web. <laughs> how, how, how you take that seriously, I, I don't really know. But uh, clearly there is this global convergence of the far right taking shape, taking form again today. Know its forms, know its history, because there's not a whole lot that's going to be really that new about this. If I can impress upon you one thing out of all of this. Capitalism runs on pretty simple logic and class conflict. I mean, yes, some things will change. Technology will change in the course of a century. Uh, styles of clothing may change in the course of a century. Other incidentals to popular culture may change over the course of a century. But basically, these ideological assaults on working people are pretty much unchanged over time in terms of their essence. They all say basically the same thing. Know your fucking place. That's constantly what the ruling class is saying to the oppressed class. They say, unite with us, national unity, racial unity, whatever it is, anything to get class collaboration instead of class struggle. That's all they fucking want. They want class rule. 
They want to maintain capitalism. They're, I mean, even seem to be slipping further back into neo-feudalism. It's really rather astonishing. So yeah, it's the same message that fascists have been putting out for a hundred years. Know it, fight it, continue to agitate, educate, and organize. And again, this doesn't really end until capitalism ends. So ending capitalism is what we must do. Anyway, what do you think? Leave questions and comments in the comment section below. We'll continue the discussion there. Otherwise, thanks for listening. Thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. If you'd like to get your name on the screen, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every donation is encouraging. They're also materially helpful, so thank you very much for those. The patrons have enabled me to spend more time on this than I would be able to do otherwise, so if you like this channel, thank me, but also thank a patron, and consider becoming one yourself. Otherwise, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting on the videos all help to boost the videos in the YouTube algorithm, help more people to see this channel, help to expand the conversation about actual socialism, actual Marxism. This channel's had great growth in the last two years during which it has existed, and I'd love to see that continue to go. It happens with your help, so thanks to everyone for helping it to get this far and for your contributions in the future. With that, thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next video.